what do I got? Well, something along the lines of dating and okay. mystery and identity and how you view yourself. And so I want to bring to light the Netflix film Passing. Um, okay. I'm not sure if you have any of you guys. Have you, did you guys have a chance to watch that? It's trending. It's like number 10 on Netflix. Not I'm aware yet. of it. Okay. But I have, I have yet to see it. So basically in passing, um, it's a story about two um, light-skinned women. And so okay. one of the women is named Claire, and she's the one that's passing as an African-American woman, but she's going around passing that. She's white. And then there's Irene, who's um, she's light-skinned too, but she's okay with her authentic self. She's married to black men. She's just, okay, I'm black. And so during in this movie, they end up meeting up because Irene – um, even though she's married to a black man and she's okay with her blackness and she has black children, she still sometimes passes herself. And so she meets Claire in this restaurant and they kind of catch up because they're childhood friends. And that's when she finds out that Claire is married to a white man. And so, exactly. And so then later on, there's a dialogue between Irene Claire and the husband and the husband's sitting there talking about how, you know, he doesn't like black people i think he might throw the n-word out there right in front of these two black women unbeknownst to him he doesn't know that his wife is actually black which is kind of the Uh crazy part and so irene's just sitting there kind of like you're letting this man degrade black people you're a black person but he doesn't know that's craziness so long story short um irene goes back to her husband they talk about it she kind of dismisses it so she doesn't really want to talk to claire claire ends up catching up with her later on in life or later on a few weeks later and um she She's basically trying to come and visit Irene and see how her life is. And she's talking about, well, you could be authentic. And, you know, she also opens up about how her life is kind of miserable because she has to be this fake person. And she's not able to have any friends because she's going around as white. And um, (laughs) she kind of left her family a long time ago to act as though to be this quote unquote white woman. And so throughout the film, um, you see how um, Irene, you see the difference between Irene and Claire, and then Claire tries to start taking over Irene's life because she likes it, and so she oh. even uh, there's a scene in there where they go out dancing with her and her husband, and then later on there's this event where the Irene is not able to go out with Claire and her husband because she's to take care of her kids or something, and she's like, you know, you just go on out with my husband, which I'm just like, I don't even know why you did that, sister friend. But um, (laughs) (laughs) she ends up basically trying to take over her life, and uh, her kids start to like her. They start to get sad when Claire, this black woman that's passing, doesn't come around. So anyway, at the end of the movie, there's the end scene where um, Claire's husband finds out that she's black, and he's banging on the door, coming to this black party. There's an open window, and Irene is standing there, and Claire comes to the window, and Claire falls out and dies. And so it's kind of this weirdness where it's like, okay, did Claire push out the window? Did the husband charge out her? Did she fall? Or did she actually jump out the window because she, her husband found out, and now it's like, okay, oh, my goodness, my life is over because I've been found out. Anyways, it's just crazy to see the how they compare the two and how um, – Claire starts to somewhat get jealous of Irene or kind of want to live her life and want to quote unquote go back into her blackness, even though she left it years ago. And so it's it's an interesting topic to see how colorism um, still affects people to this day and so that movie was kind of set back i want to say probably the 50s but even to this day um i feel like there's pieces of colorism that may affect this so i say all that to say based on just hearing that synopsis of that movie the spoiler free version of it. <laughs> I was say, yeah, I kind of spoiled the whole thing. Sorry for our viewers. Uh, spoiler alert. I probably should have opened up with that. But what do you think about colorism? Do you think that it's still prevalent to this day? And if so, does it affect you? So I'm going to start with you, Thomas. Yeah. I know that's a loaded uh, question. Th- yeah, this is a loaded <laughs> question. Um, colorism is still very present. Um, yeah. Still very present. Uh, one of the beauties of uh, being on this podcast is that I get to podcast <laughs> with folks that look like me. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I appreciate it. I, I love our hue. I love our melanated selves. We're our fully hue. melanated every time we come to you. Um, it's, it's, it's present. 
um, it was I I can even recall a time in my life where I was what you might call color struck mm. um, because of the treatment, the words that people say to you when you're young and dark skin mm. and you might, you know. And, and because of those things that happened to me growing up, I remember when I was thinking about uh, who I wanted to date or who I wanted to possibly have children with. They weren't women that looked like me, mm. being that I didn't want to uh, subject a child to what happened to me. Mm. Um, and it's crazy, you know, um, it, it was real. And it took me a while. It took me a number of years to get past that, to really get that type of thinking out of my mind. Um, it Colorism is, is, is very real. And yeah. it, it messes with a lot of people. And um, it definitely should be something that should be classified as a mental health issue because it mm -hmm. definitely it deals with how you view yourself, how you view your self-worth and everything and how you treat others around you. Yeah, definitely. And what do you think, David? Uh, colorism is real. You know, just like in America, they try to come out and say, well, you know, we're a colorless society. Mm -hmm. Race matters. Color matters. Yes. And as a 6'4", big black man, I know that when people see me, the first thing you're going to see is my physique. You're going to see my mm -hmm. color. Mm -hmm. And so it absolutely matters. And then yes. even coming up to your point, Thomas, I remember coming up, um, there was definitely a clear line between light-skinned people, mm -hmm. light-skinned black people, and mm -hmm. dark-skinned black people yes. who had, like, you know, my skin tone complexion. And really it wasn't until, speaking of the impact of it, mm -hmm. it wasn't until I got to, you know, really to college, right, mm -hmm. that even though I was loved by my family and nobody really, uh, I don't, in my mind, remember any personal attacks. I knew the difference, even in media, right? Mm -hmm. Even in classrooms, the way people were treated. Even in my family, let me let me reel this in. Mm -hmm. Even in my family, there was a distinction between light skinned cousins and some who were dark skinned, right? Yeah. And it wasn't until I got to college that I realized the power of the chocolate. Mm. Mm. The power of the chocolate. Yes. I've heard that before. Yes. That's when I realized <laughs> it, and it's when I realized that I was beautiful, and and I realized the mm. attraction in my. You know, my identity and my confidence grew in terms of what God blessed me with. Because, again, he blessed me to look like this, and everybody black is beautiful. You know, yes. white is beautiful. You know, those who are uh, brown. And it wasn't until I, you know, I really had a firm, you know, gain of, of who I was. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and because that impacts everything else, even dating, let's face yeah. it. Yeah. Even yeah. going out dating, whether you're going to stand up, you know, publicly going out professionally, you mm -hmm. got to feel confident in who you are. And right. if you receive messages as this society does through like colorism, like this movie, you know, it, it sends a signal to you that certain hues are accepted, others right. are not. not. And so that's something that if you if you're black and you've grown up in this country, you have to overcome that. Right. Definitely. And I will say I think it's prevalent still t to this day. Yeah. And I, I don't think it necessarily ever really affected me. I don't I didn't really ever really see that except for I do remember in high school. Um, I think it was on Twitter. They would have like hash girl, hashtag dark skin, uh, dark skin girls or hashtag dark skin baddie, hashtag light skin baddie, hashtag. And that's the first time that I really saw colorism. And mm. there were some girls in high school that would like debate over, oh, do I fit into the yeah. lights? Am I light enough to fit into this light skin category to hashtag on Twitter? And it's kind of like. It was just eye opening. I'm like, people really think about that. Like, I never really thought about my skin, and I started thinking. I'm like, okay, well, am I a hashtag dark skin? Yeah. Like, what what am I? Like, uh, like how like how does that play out? And then how do people see me? And so then you also see sometimes on Twitter and social media people going back and forth over, you know, is light better? Is dark better? Um, you see people get upset when they see a whole bunch of light skinned women in. Um, music videos as opposed to dark skin or women that look like they're from the island. So I think it's still very, very um, popular to this day. And I think the conversation definitely needs to be had. And there's a, um, I want to say a famous quote or saying that goes around. Um, and I think it was passed on by like a slave owner way back in the uh, way back when slavery was um, happening. And it says something about if you, the way to keep blacks divided is by their skin tone. And so I feel like it was a way for white people to psychologically um, have that hold on us and affect us and divide us so that we never came together and yeah. were strong. And I feel like once people start to realize that, maybe, well, some people do realize that. But I guess my next thing or my next question is how do we 
deface colorism? How do we get rid of it? Because it's been so it's been since slavery, and to this day, even when I was in high school, it's still going on. You know what, um, Chloe? That's a that's a heavy question. Mm-hmm. I mean, just sitting here and listening to David talk about it, I started going mm-hmm. back through. I mean, it it was crazy for my own personal experience mm-hmm. and having to do with this conversation, having to relive stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember being told, Oh, I'm this black. Yeah. I'm too black. Like now nah, I remember distinctly in class, somebody mm-hmm. being like, Oh no, that's nah. That's it, it, it's black. It's not Thomas black, mm. but oh, it's wow. black. Like I had my own special <laughs> tone of black. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I was that dark. Yeah. And the thing that was crazy uh, is that it 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 made me mm. hate my skin. Mm. Now you take this and like David, you have your awakening right. moment. Yes. And the crazy part about it was, it wasn't a person of color. That wow. taught me to love my wow. skin. Wow. Wow. I didn't hear about the beauty of this skin until I was much older, until I was like 19, 20, yeah. mm. and I'm yeah. in different places and I'm seeing people of different hues. When not you say, all. When you say different hues, are you saying that? I, I mean, different races. No, I'm saying, did was it someone black, someone out of the black or brown community, like Asian American Pacific Islander or no. something? Or was it an a no, actual it, white it was actually, white person? It was actually white women. Wow. That truly appreciated. Well, they um, were pro- never mind. I, and and, I, and I, I get it. I get it. That truly loved or, or made me feel mm-hmm. some kind of way about the skin that I was in. Yeah. Through all of that, then when I was out, or I would be with those people, mm. then I was called a sellout by the same people mm. that told me I was too dark to be with them. What did you want? So in order for this to go away, it's going to be some heavy lifting. We have to finally look at each other as just all one, as one. We can't divide ourselves anymore. We can't yeah. give preferential treatment mm-hmm. to, the lighter, to the lighter colored children. Like yeah. we've been doing for years, we can't. But that's probably tell also them hard too. If how beautiful society, they are, if, and so make sure you forget to tell your dark skinned child that your dark skinned child is just as beautiful. I get yeah. that too, but I also feel as though um, it's also in the black community, but it's also hard because you have society that's also looking in and saying, "Okay, well, maybe I'll hire you, or maybe I'll talk to you because you're of a lighter tone or a darker tone or whatever." So I think it's in our community, but it's also out the our external environment is also affecting us as well. Yeah. And, and you know what I want to get at here is that somebody else's rejection of me does not mean I have to internalize it. Right. Mm-hmm. So what it boils down to is that when we come from a biblical standpoint, we have to absolutely demolish the argument that there are any superior and inferior races, that yes. one mm-hmm. skin tone is better than another. It's a lie because it's a divide and conquer strategy. Think about it. Um, Spike Lee's school days highlighted it. Mm-hmm. You had the AKAs, basically, and you mm-hmm. had the Deltas, you know, light skin. Right. You got the Crips. You got the Bloods. Mm-hmm. You got the, the Kappas, right, you know, mm-hmm. and they're red, the Qs, and they're purple. Mm-hmm. Always a color, dividing people, and somebody trying to claim superiority based on a color. And so we need to get away from these color schemes and start to come back and say, if we're going to dismantle that argument, because every argument has to be attacked with truth, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And just simply come back and say, you know what, there are no superior and then inferior colors god created them all they're no inferior or superior people and part of racism's thing is to make you buy into the myth of racism Mm -hmm. and you have to look people straight in the eye and simply say that's not true yeah and you have to stand with such a tenacity in your person right that you let them know that what you're saying i don't accept it and guess what i'm going to affirm myself i'm going to encourage myself and accept myself and even if i don't get that job like you said chloe Mm -hmm. guess what it's okay because I understand why you gave it to somebody else right. who looks differently. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they're better than me. It's that you're still supporting your system through your policies. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. But how do you get people to, I feel like that was great, David, but mm-hmm. how do you get people to internalize and feel that? Right, like, right what we're you, doing. You mm-hmm. got started that in mm-hmm. these circles, yeah. in these podcasts. Also, now we have social media. We didn't have that years mm-hmm. ago, like when we were coming up. And no. it starts at those kitchen and dining room tables. Like you hear politicians today talking about the, the kitchen table conversations. Right. It starts right there. Just like case in point, I'm just going to be completely candid. The same way you have many people, um, I'm just going to say people in other ethnic groups, 
will say disparaging things at their dinner tables mm -hmm. to their children and start that stuff, we got to be the ones to speak in our circles and affirm each other. That's true. It yeah. starts in a local conversation before it can become a macro conversation. Right. Yeah. yeah. You got to you gotta preach the love at home. And I think that's a good point because I think one of the things you said was we have to realize it's not us. We don't have to internalize it. Yeah. And I think that has to do with colorism. And I don't want to say necessarily with racism, too, but I know that sometimes at work, if something doesn't go uh, right for me or something, I'm like, is that because I'm black? You know? And so I feel like that might be the same yeah. thing with colorism. Like, we might be like, is that because I'm dark skin? That's the question. Is that it? because I'm light yeah. skin? Like, you have to stop. But then it's like you have to stop doing that. But at the same time, it's like you also have to know when it actually is that, too, as well. That is true. That's good. That is true. That's a good point, Chloe. But I think what David said, um, <sighs> it's nail on the head. You got to do it at home. Yeah. What if, what, I, I look at my situation. Would my situation have been different if I had two parents telling me about mm. how beautiful How beautiful. I am? That's right. Affirming. And not that they didn't. But it wasn't at the same. It wasn't magna. It wasn't. It, mm. it wasn't magnified like what I heard at school. Mm. You know. So your friends, you're trying to fit in with them. You know, this is the stuff that you hear. And so if we could say it and make it and make it meaningful at home, where I could prepare my child, no matter what, you are beautiful. Yeah. No matter what your hue is, you are beautiful. You are a beautiful human being. Yeah. And keep instilling this in this child. No one should be able to take it away from them. Yeah. They all raise it. What, what does the word say, David? Raise up a child in the way that they should go. That's right. And when they're older, they will not depart, depart from, it. from it. If I keep telling you about how beautiful you are, yeah. if I keep telling you about how, how special you are, maybe you'll even think about the decisions you make before you make them because Absolutely. you know that there's value in you. Absolutely. When you don't feel valued or you don't see value, mm -hmm. you do things that will diminish your value. Absolutely. No, All I, the time. I agree with that statement. And I say that because I told you how I didn't really start seeing that until high school and it didn't necessarily affect me. And I think that's in part because my father, um, there was, I have two sisters and we grew up. Every morning he would come in our room and be like, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay. You're beautiful. And then whatever grade I was in, he was like, you're the best first grader, blah, blah, blah. All the oh, way, right. even even high school, you're the yeah. best 11th grader awesome. out there. You're beautiful. That I don't ever let no one. That I, he did that to each one of my sisters. So when people would try to, not saying that I never I had insecurities, but it was kind of hard when you're hearing that in your ear every uh -huh. single, not yeah. just once a day. When you're hearing yeah. that in your ear every single day when you wake up in the morning, yes. it's yes. like, it's kind of hard for you to come at me and be like, oh, you're ugly. It's like, what? My father just told me there you I go, was boy. beautiful this morning. Yeah. And he's been told me mm. for the past, mm. like. And it's who told you. Yeah. yeah. And it's who told it's me who too. Told you. Yeah. yeah. That, that. That you don't understand the importance of that. That's that your father mm -hmm. was telling you that versus your mom telling you that yeah. the more nurturing one mm -hmm. that your father spoke that life yeah. over you every morning. That's amazing. We need to give him a hand. Yeah, For real. yeah, For real. absolutely. Chloe's dad. He's pretty dope. He's on yeah. the front lines, <laughs> changing yeah. lives each every day. I like that. Matter of fact. Have him call me in the morning. I need him to tell me. <laughs> yeah, you the best Thomas that you can be. That's right. <laughs> Because here's the underlying truth to what you just said is that repetition is the mother of all mm -hmm. learning and faith comes by hearing mm -hmm. because with the messages we continue to hear is what we believe. You're right. Yeah. And internalize ultimately. Definitely. Definitely. Well, I say all that to say your black is beautiful no matter yeah, what shade all right. you are. All right. <laughs> and all right. that's all I'm going to say. And I'm going to end on that. And I'm going to hand it over to David. Oh, that's good stuff, Chloe. I, you know, I'm feeling the power right now. So I'm going to go right to this <laughs> subject. Right? Good, good. We're dealing with um, these these court cases, four powerful court cases that are out there right now. Mm -hmm. And I really just want to get you all's take because, mm -hmm. you know, I felt somewhat, um, I got to admit, especially with the Rittenhouse case in Kenosha, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. I, you know, I came away saying, wow, I really wanted um, for those that I know to get that level of great treatment, you know, to be coddled by the judge, you know, to have a, a system where uh, people were sympathetic even though this guy did everything wrong, we're going to highlight some of that coming out.